Hello and welcome to Just Talking About Films episode three. My name is Ian Sargentson. Uh, mine's Luke Taylor and it is great to be with you this week um, to have a great chat about and it. I tell you what, this week's a significant week for us because not only do we have our first guest, but also we can go back to the cinema before we're back here again. Uh, although I keep checking Cineworld's website and tickets are not on sale yet. As any, uh, I, I was going to throw to you guys and ask you a question, but I won't do that yet. Um, first of all, I'll introduce Simon. Uh, hiya, Simon. It's good to see you. Great to see you, Luke. Long time <laughs> no see. It has been a while. Simon and I uh, used to work together. Um, and uh, Simon, I, I, <laughs> we used to talk about film a lot at work, um, maybe sometimes too much. Um, but... Uh, there was a whole period of fair of, 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 uh, time where the printer that I printed to was in Simon's office. And I knew that I had to stack up my print jobs because if I was going in Simon's office, we were talking at least half an hour before I came back out again. <laughs> so it was the, uh, the print of the black hole. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so we had, we had long, long chats about films. And by the way, I think you pitched the idea for Rogue One before Rogue One existed. Did I? I don't know. Yeah, you talked about that the, the, the flaw in the Death Star was uh, the fault of an engineer who did it on purpose. Do you know, that's, it's funny that you're saying that because it's ringing a bell now. <laughs> I think we did have that conversation. But this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, didn't we have a conversation about the purge long before that concept was... <laughs> we did, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather be responsible for Rogue One than the purge, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, indeed. Uh, anyway, what I was going to ask you guys, um, I've, I haven't managed to book tickets yet, but has any of your cinemas been available for tickets booking? Uh, yeah, I, I think you can get tickets from The View now, which is one of my locals, but you can't get Cineworld yet because I, I keep checking Cineworld as well because I have a card. But it depends what's showing. I mean, I sort of try and I go to a variety of different cinemas and it just depends what I want to see. But I, it, it does make sense value for money wise for me to have a Cineworld card. Uh, given the <laughs> I go normally at least once or twice a week so yeah um, for me I don't have a Cineworld card I would like one but there's not one close enough to me to justify it I'd spend more money traveling to it than I would be saving <laughs> by um, getting a card but we have an everyman here in Clitheroe so I've got an everyman membership so um, it's great I love watching it in luxury but yeah they're open um, and there's a few films but I haven't booked any yet yeah, well, I mean, you know, the first film back is the one we've all been waiting for. Peter Rabbit 2. <laughs> yes, I noticed that was top of the views list of, uh, you know, that's kind of, you could probably lead with something a little more dynamic. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um, you know, I mean, hey, hey, it's each to their own and, and maybe some viewers will really get a lot out of Peter Rabbit 2. I don't know. So um, we're going to come to our first section of uh, the podcast and we're going to catch up with what we've been watching this week. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Ian. What have you been watching this week? Um, well, I've watched Star Wars um, Episode Four. I don't know if I'd watched that before last week or I was just about to watch it, but I, I, I re-watched that again, really enjoyed it. Um, and I, re I watched for the first time Dark Waters, um, which I posted Ooh, about on good. Twitter yesterday. Yeah, um, it was quite, yeah, I thought it was a well-made film. I liked the colour palette and the cinematography and I thought the performances were good. But it's again, it's one of them things that's based on real life. So it was more about the story and the absolute horror of what went on there. I had no idea. Mm. And it, it's, it's just utterly shocking, really. Yeah, it's about yeah a farmer that thinks that the plant next to him, the chemical plant, is killing his animals and no one will believe him until a lawyer for a chemical firm listens to his a case as a favour to his grandmother. And then it just spirals from there. And I said it's based on real life and it goes over 20 years really about his fight for justice for these people and just the horrors of what was going on and the cover up and the power and the greed. Yeah, it was a good watch, a tough watch because, it, you know, this is real, real lives and people have been, you know, terribly affected by it. But it was a well-made film. I really enjoyed it. What about you, Simon? What have you been watching uh, this week? What have I been watching this week? Well, well, I tell you what, I rewatched second time I've seen it actually. The the Mitchells versus the Machines, which That's I don't so know if I, <laughs> either of you have seen, but uh, I found it thoroughly entertaining. Um, 
I watched it the first time just myself and my wife and then the second time with the children and um yes the, uh, you see my children are at that age now where um they're sort of getting older and more sarcastic and I actually have to say to them you know okay this is a really funny cartoon you'd like this one it's you know <laughs> so um, it's it's kind of gone back to the way it was where you know I would I would be the one um who always wanted to watch the sort of so-called children's films and now, <laughs> now we have to anyway um but I enjoyed that very much I think that it's uh I mean you guys have both seen it right Absolutely. I haven't seen it Luke you haven't seen it okay so it was originally made by uh I believe it was Sony and yeah. they were going to release it as a as a cinema release but then it, it got sold to Netflix which is a bit of a shame because I think it would have looked fabulous on a big screen and it's and kind it's, of disappeared it, a bit as well it hasn't made the splash it would have made Yes, that's the thing. I think they're probably kicking themselves now because if they just hung on a bit longer, they could have had a cinema release. But uh, agreeably anarchic and uh, good fun. So I saw that. And sorry, one other thing I saw on a completely different note. Um, finally caught up with a film called The Hunt. Have you seen that? Yeah. So the, the problem is if I miss something in the cinema it then goes on a list and it can sometimes be years hence before I catch up with it. Now this one, I very foolishly... Is it the one, is it, sorry, is it the one with a school teacher? Yes, with Mads yeah, Mikkelsen, yeah. that's yeah, right. Seen, yeah, very good film. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a terrific film. Luke, have you, you've not seen it. Mads no, Mikkelsen? Uh, okay, well he... Yeah, well, it's a very, very strong performance from him. He's a school teacher who is wrongly accused of paedophilia and you get this cautionary tale of what then happens uh, as an escalating rumour mill encloses in on him in this right. town. And it's, it's, a, it's very, very, very powerful. I mean, it, it yeah. really makes hmm. it thought-provoking and it's, uh, you know, in, in, incisive and fascinating. And I would very much recommend it. Beautifully shot. The cinematography in particular yeah. really struck me. As I was watching, I was thinking, I really wish I'd seen this in the cinema because it looked fabulous. And... Uh, the ending in particular really stayed with me. Mm. Um, I thought it's a very, very clever ending, particularly Ian. I don't know if you remember the, the very closing seconds of the yeah. of the piece. Very, very clever and thought provoking. Yeah, I think it's hard to forget. I mean, the whole film is very emotive, but as you say, that final shot as it just ends. Um, yeah, it was just very, very good. Hmm. I'll have to give that a try. I'll have to give that yeah, a try. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a difficult subject matter, but. And the injustice that you that I felt, the empathy I felt, outrage. Um, it, it's just it's it's complicated because you've got children involved in different things. But yeah, the rumor mill, the ostracization, ostracize, or what exclusion um, from the community. It's just yeah, really powerful stuff. Yeah, and I think I think what what uh, it's it's a it's a cautionary tale. I think mm. you know, and it's it's. It's a very, very interesting look at, you know, what happens when a lie is told and then just spirals out of all control. Mm. And, uh, you know, rumour festers into fact. It's, mm. it's, it's very, very dangerous. Interesting. Anyway. All right. Well, I'll have to give that a try. Um, well, this week I've... Um, I, I, I rewatched Tenet this week. Um, and I have to say... Didn't understand it any more than the first time. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm with it to a certain degree, and then, and then when it starts going backwards, I'm like, okay, I get this. I'm following this. Once it gets to that final sequence, that um, battle that's happening forwards and backwards, I just, I, I just, I can't work it out. I can't. It just loses me completely at that point. I, I, I can't. I, I literally was trying to get my head around. There's one bit where there's a building that both explodes at the top and the bottom at the same time, backwards, and I, and, and that just broke me. My brain broke at that point. I couldn't do it. Mine broke well before that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love Christopher Nolan, but I have to say, Tenet has probably pushed it too much for me. Well, this is a weird one for me because. Maybe I'm, I don't know, because this is <laughs> the risk of sounding incredibly arrogant. I never had a problem <laughs> understanding Tenet. To me, it's just um, a much more expensive version of Red Dwarf's Backwards and uh, with far less humour. I, 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 I need you to explain it to me sometimes, Simon, because uh, I still don't get it. 
<laughs> well, okay, maybe we should do a podcast on tennis and else, <laughs> with diagrams. <laughs> yeah, walk me through it. <laughs> um, I also filled in a, um, it, like you were saying, there's some things if you miss it at the cinema, you just don't catch for a while. Um, and I hadn't seen, I'm sorry to say, Creed or Creed 2. Um, so I filled those those uh, missing holes in this week and got to say, Creed is, wow, that was a great film. I, uh, I'm i not a big fan of boxing films, but Creed, I, I, Creed 2, and, and I know, I don't think Creed 2 was as good as Creed 1, but I was in floods of tears at the end of Creed 2. You know that I'm a big Rocky fan. Rocky is, um, you know, my favourite film of all time. I like Creed, but purely for Rocky. Do you know what I mean? I think you take him out of it, it's a bang average film. I think Tony Bellew, it's one of the worst acting performances I've ever seen. Do you know what I mean? I know he's not an actor, he is a I'm boxer. Say, he's a boxer. He, he boxed well. Just from my perspective, with Creed, uh, I mean, I'm just to, to second you, I'm a big fan of Rocky as well. Um, incredible piece of work and, uh, you know, a classic, no question. Um, th now, the interesting thing is that, that for me, the sequels are increasingly less interesting. And I, mm. I think actually of the original Rocky sequels, for me, the only one that progresses it in a significant way is the third film, mm. where he's got, you know, he's a bit richer and, you know, the, 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 that whole dynamic and, and what. But I think that four is just three again, but with a Cold War <laughs> twist. Yeah. And um, repeats a lot of the plot beats, just as yeah. two kind of repeats the plot beats of the first one, it, it, more or less. But um, in the case of uh, the, 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 the Creed film, I was very impressed. I have to say I'm with Luke on that. Uh, I do think that it is more than just Sylvester Stallone for me. Uh, I did I did like Creed very much. And I agree, Luke, Creed 2 is not as good. But I have to say I was very, very surprised by you know bring, bringing back Ivan Drago the way they did and having you know the relation the dynamics the, the, the dynamics with him and his ex-wife and, and all of that whole side of it gave it a level of poignancy that I think was you know previously unseen in Ivan Drago. <laughs> so <laughs> he felt I did, sorry for I, him. He actually felt yeah, sorry for him. I did I did feel sorry for him. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Creed 3 because Sylvester Salon's not in it. Mm. So yeah. So it'll be interesting to see whether I'm right and he does carry the film or it's... I'm not. Michael B. Jordan's good in it, and I like the story to a point. I just think the actual good storyline is from Rocky because, as I've said before, Rocky isn't ultimately a sports film from the beginning. It's a love story, and mm. you feel about Rocky and Adrian and that whole narrative that runs throughout them all. It's more important what happens on outside the ring and inside. Yeah. And as Simon said, it gets progressively less so and goes, tries to appeal to a wider audience with every single um, film that comes out until it starts off as a classic piece of work and then ultimately gets to something that wants to be chest-beaten, patriotic, <laughs> all-action, underdog, winning-in-the-last-minute kind of thing. Well, I think that sort of is de defeating the entire point of the first film, which is yeah. that he doesn't win... Yeah. He goes the distance, and that's yeah. the that's the sort of to me the entire point of the story, yeah. um, which is what made it which is what made it great in my opinion. So yeah, that's what I've done this week. Um, I also watched. I know it doesn't count. It's not. It, it came out of the cinema, so it does count. But it is a documentary of. Uh, I rewatched uh, uh, Searching for Sugar Man this week as well, um, which is. Uh, still, every time the end of that again. Maybe I'm just feeling emotional this week, but again, absolutely floods of tears at the end of that. Okay, I haven't seen it. Have you not? Oh, I tell you, I it's one of those stories it. can only be told as a documentary. It wouldn't work any other way, and it works even better if you know nothing about it. Yeah, I mean, I heard of it, and again, it was one of those ones that I missed it in the cinema, went on the pile. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need to catch up. Really with it. worth doing. Have you seen it, Ian? No, I'm the same. It's documentaries. I mean, I like them, but I don't really seek them out unless they really pique my interest. And it was one of them ones that I'd heard the buzz about it and thought I'd get round to it, but still haven't. Oh, it'll get you there, right there. Well, I hope so because there's very few films that that really, you know, get me to be in floods of tears, as you say. If it doesn't, you're a monster. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Um, let's let's move on. Uh, so that's us catching up with the week ahead. But we, uh, it's great to have a guest on this week and a chance to ask somebody new some questions about what film means to them. Uh, so Simon, we're going to start with a very um, <laughs> a very difficult one to answer, I guess. What is your favourite film? And you can go with one off because who has just one? Well, I was going to say because I think I have at least 100. And, um, <laughs> I'm going to pick one film. I'm going to try and steer away from obvious choices. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick one film which uh, had a huge impact on me the first time I saw it as a child. Now, I had uh, been introduced to the films of David Lee by my father inadvertently when he first time I ever saw Dr. Zhivago, um, which completely blew me away as a, as a, as a nine-year-old. That's how I learned about the Russian Revolution, apart from anything else. It was also the, the first time I'd ever seen a film that long and with a sad ending. So it completely, completely blew me away. But um, after I remember after the film was finished, there was a little documentary about David Lean's other films. And in the midst of this documentary, there were clips of his other films, and I'll never forget this. There was a clip of the beginning of his take on Great Expectations from 1946, one of Lean's early films. And it opens in this vivid atmospheric graveyard scene where young Pip is at the grave of his parents and there's that tree looming over him, creaking in the wind somewhere in you know the Kent marshlands. And I, I remember just list, watching this scene and being just blown away by the monochrome cinematography and the you know everything about it was so atmospheric. And I thought, I have to see this film. This film just looks... And I remember I turned to my dad and I said, I, I want to see every film David Lean's ever made and especially that one, OK? And a few years later, um, well, I don't know, maybe two or three years later, it wouldn't have been that much later, it, Great Expectations popped up on television on Channel 4 one Sunday afternoon. And I watched it. And honestly, it was one of the formative experiences of my, you know, it was one of the, you know, it was one of the great, I, I think that Great Expectations, David Lean's take on it is one of the greatest films ever made. I, I just think it's a brilliant film. I don't really want to say too much more because I, I, you guys say you haven't <laughs> you wanna, seen it. I, you I, don't I, want to spoil it. <laughs> no. So yeah, the Great Expectations, David Lean, 1946. Uh, you know, I have since, I've seen it countless times. I've, si I've, I've even managed to see it in the cinema. So if I was to watch it with Great Expectations about it, would they be met? Yes, they would. The only thing I would say <laughs> is that it will it will ruin other. Uh, the thing is, the, the it's the benchmark by which all Dickens adaptations must be judged. It just leads us to asking because that's you, 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 there's, there's your favourite and there's the ones that you think are the best. But which is the film that got you to love films? Ah, uh, well, that would be E.T. because I saw that that was the second film I saw in the cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that would have been 1982, the original run in 1982, and, and it just completely blew me away. Yeah. Um, on, on for all sorts of reasons. Um, I think if you if you think about just the start of that film, where it's wordless, you've got this sequence where the, you know there are aliens poking around in the forest, collecting botanical samples, taking them back to the spaceship, and you've got that incredibly atmospheric. Um, you know, direction from Spielberg, whose camera is always at a child's level, by the way. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about no. the film. It's always at a child's level. And for most of that film, you don't get a full shot of an adult. It's always from, which is why when the scientists turn up, it's always from a, a the waist, you know, the waist level with a guy with mm -hmm. the keys on his belt. You just hear the jangling of the keys. It's kind of very menacing. Um, and then, of course, the scientists turn up. E.T.'s wandered too far from the ship. He, you know, has to run back to the ship. And, you know, I remember watching this at the age of seven and being desperate for him to get back to the ship. <laughs> and, you know, my heart was in my mouth. I was like, please get back to the ship. But of course, I knew he wouldn't because then there'd be no film. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was incredibly intense, that opening 10 minutes. Mm. And I remember, I'll never forget this, it, cu it cuts to Elliot and the children um, playing Dungeons and Dragons just immediately after that scene. I remember just this relief. I'm like, oh, you know, this really, after this incredible tension of that opening. And the clever thing about Spielberg, I think, in that film is what he did, what he did was he creates an alien that's not immediately attractive, um, quite ugly. And I think he actually said it, it's, it's a, you know, a face that only a mother could love. You know, it's got that sort of, um, but, and yet E.T., you know, is, is, is a wonderful story. It completely 
completely sucked me in. And it's funny because I remember, I didn't think about it in these specific terms, but I remember thinking things like, for instance, in that opening sequence, it's amazing that there's no dialogue in this. It's all told visually. Hmm. And I remember thinking, which of course, you know, cinema at its purest. And I also remember thinking later on in the film, uh, short, towards the end, I remember I really needed the loo. And I was kind of, <laughs> and my dad said to me, you know, do you, do you want to just nip out for a minute? Because, you know, this bit's not very important. And I said, no, I have to see every frame. I knew instinctively, if it wasn't important, the editor would have cut it. What was G- I actually discovered this later in the original script? He was going to be taken to a hospital, and Spielberg said, No, 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 have them invade the home because mm. it's much more like a nightmare then. And you have this, this um, invasive government, you know, thing with all this, you know, scientists and technology. It's when you arrive at the house, it's, it's terrifying, yeah. absolutely it's terrifying. It's really, really scary, yeah. and and traumatic and invasive. And what happened was, I actually have no memory of the film past the point where. Uh, they tell, you know, Elliot's mother what the, you know, they've stashed a sick alien in their home. I've got no memory of the film from that point to the point where E.T. comes back to life again and Elliot's kind of pretending to cry, you know, when it's, <laughs> it's actually a very funny scene. But um, all the stuff in the middle, I blacked out of my memory and I remember it didn't get released on VHS for years and it was only at the back end of the 80s that it finally got a VHS release. I watched it again and I, I don't remember any of this traumatic stuff about them trying to resuscitate E.T. and all the rest of it. And, and my mum said to me, well, don't you don't remember any of it? I said, no, she said, and then he said, you don't remember that you were beside yourself in the cinema, you know, and would not be comforted because <laughs> E.T. had, you know, I was I, literally, my parents said they was, I was completely beside myself. And it was so traumatic, I blacked it out, completely blacked it out. Um, I don't remember any of that, that, that sequence what in the cinema. I, I remember everything else. Just not that. That's such a good film. Such a good film. Anyway, so yeah, so I, I would say that if if that was the 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 the, the Damascus Road conversion experience to cinema, <laughs> it would have been that. Um, but you got to understand there were several films along the way that were formative experiences. That was one. Yeah, Great Expectations was another. But just very, just very quickly, uh, you said that was the second one you saw in the cinema. Yes, first? The, the first the first one I ever saw in the cinema was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was Isn't wonderful. That, I mean, I, I was going to guess for most people. I think if you were to ask, not everyone, but most, what was the first film you saw at the cinema? It's going to be a Disney cartoon. Jungle what was Book yours? Uh, for me, it wasn't actually. For me, it was Ghostbusters. But that's, for most people, <laughs> it's a Disney cartoon. <laughs> what was Mine. yours, Ian? Jungle Book. Oh, excellent. You, you, okay, so, so Ian, <laughs> here's the thing, right? W- w- there used to be, I, don't, I, I mean, so I don't know, I presume how old you are, but when I grew up, they would regularly re-release Snow White, um, Bambi, The Jungle Book, 101 Dalmatians, and so on. All, you know, th- these got regular, you know, every five or ten years they'd come back. And I think I was the last generation that had that, or at least maybe... I yeah, they did it up to the early 90s maybe, but not beyond yeah. that. And, and I remember because my own younger brothers, you know, my youngest brother is 10 years younger than me, and I remember I took them to see a re-release of Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, <laughs> and that was the last time it ever got a cinema re-release. But, t- t- sorry, Ian, I, did, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, so you saw The Jungle Book? Yeah, so- and I think from what you've said, Simon, when we were children, we watched films in a very different way. Yeah. So you said you were appreciating the non-dialogue in E.T. and the, the techniques used in, in Snow White. I, all I remember is that I was with my mother and I had fruit, pos- fruit pastels in a box. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. The first time I'd ever seen them in a box. But I remember, th- that I remember being impressed with the sights and smells and the size of the screen. But I don't remember anything about that experience of watching the film apart from I've loved The Jungle Book my whole life. So mm. I know that it had an impact, but not one that I can recall now. Simon, what film do you think deserves more credit? And you could even go as far as to say it's a film you think is great, but for some reason, nobody else likes it. OK, well, I'm get ah, well... It's not that nobody else likes it. Was that, was that a qualification? Well, it's not no. necessarily. It's just an, ex- an expansion, maybe. Okay, well, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to change tack here and go with a film I saw in early 1994. uh, And I saw this um, as a student at a matinee showing in a completely empty cinema. Now, I'll preface with this. Early 1994, I remember as being one of the most exciting run-ups to an Oscar campaign that I've ever seen. 
you know, there's a very, very strong list of films out for that Oscar season. You had uh, everything from Schindler's List to uh, Shadowlands, Shortcuts, lots of films beginning with a sh, turns out. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was there was the the Age of Innocence Scorsese film. There was the, uh, the piano. There was uh, The Remains of the Day. There were a whole bunch of really high, high prestige films that you know, it was a particularly strong season. Um, of, of films competing for the Oscars that year. And in the midst of all of these uh, came Brian De Palma's Carlito's Way, mm. which I think is absolutely superb. And, uh, you know, I was the only one in the cinema. I remember, you know, nobody else, I've got, have, I don't know anyone else who saw that in the cinema. Uh, mm. I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. The thing about De Palma is uh, he's notoriously hit and miss. He's very, very technically skilled. He was off, you know, in the, the early part of his career, he was dubbed Hitchcock's natural successor with films like, you know, Dressed to Kill and, and, and so on. But the thing is that I often felt about his work is that he, dazzling technically, but, but, you know, all style and no substance. In the case of Carlito's Way, I felt that for once his considerable technical skills were put in service of the story. Uh, mm. Now, I know he's adapting, I think, two novels uh, in that film, but it's a terrific screenplay. And I think that with one of, I think one of Al Pacino's best performances, one of the things I love about it is it's, it's got how it ends up where it ends up is nicely ironic. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's got, it's got that thing in tra tragedy is best when it has a sort of ironic twist to it, where it's kind of like, it's, it's not the thing that you think is going to get him, but mm -hmm. what does get him is the thing that really ought to have been obvious from the word go. It's like, that's the thing you overlooked. And that's what, you know, and it's, it's brilliantly done. It's, I would, oh, just one other thing I should say about it. Uh, the suspense in the, it gets top marks for suspense from me uh, for two sequences. Firstly, an early scene in act one with a sort of drug deal that goes wrong. And then there's a scene towards the end of the film, which culminates in a big shootout in Grand Central Station, which kind of recalls De Palma's earlier film, The Untouchables, which is also very good. Um, but it's, it's this sort of 15 minute build up to that mm. full of very great steady cam shots and, and, you know, suspense where, you know, he's never going to get out of this surely moments. And then it does sort of, you think it's all going to kick off and then it doesn't. And then you think it's all going to kick off and it doesn't. And then it finally does kick off <laughs> in a very suspenseful way. And it's, it's really, really well, it's absorbing. It's emotionally engaging. I think it's got genuine tragic pathos to it. And I think, oh, and I also would just say that I know that uh, De Palma's remake of Scarface is very popular, which he also did with Al Pacino, but I've never much cared for it. I've, I've always thought Scarface was, again, all style, no substance, and pretty horrible in terms of how much gore is involved. Whereas Carlito's Way, for me, is the opposite. It's it's very emotionally engaging. It's it sort of, the gore is, I mean, it's still gruesome in parts, but it's, it's a lot more toned down. Mm. And I think, again, it just, it feels like a much more satisfying watch. And I take that over Scarface any day. Yeah, I, I rewatched it. Well, no, I watched it a couple of years ago because it was one of them things that I started watching films that I probably should watch now as a mature film watcher that I didn't really like. As um, Simon was saying, Scarface and, uh, well, you know, Casino and Goodfellas all had a higher profile because of the violence and stuff. So I watched them and didn't, not didn't really get them. I just thought they were indulgent nonsense for a bit. And then I wanted to watch films differently. So I watched Carlito as well. And I was impressed. I was impressed with Pacino throughout. The story was a bit different to what I expected because I expected it just be like, oh yeah, he goes back because he can't get away from it. But there was a real tension there. There was a real journey there was a real conflict that you could feel yeah it was all palpable um for the viewer and it wasn't just like this predictable oh well he'll go back because that's where he belongs there was you gen you genuinely were rooting for him yeah i think that's what i liked about the film he was a genuinely sympathetic character oh, and yeah. i think it really it really drew you in emotionally and you you it, as i said it had real dramatic it had real tragic weight to it i felt and the, and the love story element too with penelope ann miller who i think is wonderful and she was terrific in kindergarten cop too but she's terrific in this and uh, those are the sort of two films with her that i really like so yeah i i think it's it's yeah so that would be my answer to that question um what about uh, simon uh, one film where you just don't get it you know okay everybody A seems Ava to love it avatar avatar uh, avatar. I, to be I honest have... i'm there with you on that one <laughs> i can quite... sorry quite... 
you were quite quick with that, wasn't it? There was no hesitation <laughs> there. Avatar, avatar. <laughs> yes, no, well, absolutely and emphatically, and I'll tell you why. Um, I, I mean, I like James Cameron's other films, but mm. for me, the rule of thumb with Cameron is the bigger his budgets get, the less interesting they get. So, mm. but you know, by that get metric, bigger every film as well. <laughs> I know, well, by that metric, The Terminator is, is still his best film, I think, mm-hmm. followed by Aliens. And then, um, I, you know, Terminator 2 I like as well, and I did like The Abyss. But, I, you know, I even like Titanic as well. I mean, t- Titanic is at least satisfying on a kind of big-scale disaster movie blunt instrument kind of level. You've missed out his best film. Which? True Lies. Oh, True Lies. Yeah, I like <laughs> True Lies as well. Look, I say, I, I'm just prefacing what I'm about to say by... That's the I'm height not, of cinema. I, I'm not trying to kind of, you know, because Cameron has done some really good films, okay? That's all I'm really trying to say. I didn't, I, I didn't like the ending of Titanic, though. It was a, yeah, it was a bit of a damp squib. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's so predictable. I know. <laughs> yes, actually, actually, the, 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 thing is, the thing is, I mean, I know it's trendy to knock Titanic in certain quarters, and I've never understood that because I thought, look, Cameron may have made this film out of raw ambition, but he did it really well. Yeah, yeah. And there are things, there are all sorts of nits you can pick with it. Yes, it's kind of one dimensional with the characterization, and, uh, you know, it's not the most nuanced of films, but sometimes you don't need, sometimes you just need the blunt instrument. And I think it, it did that really well. Um, and I think it's foolish yeah. to pretend otherwise. Uh, now, with Avatar, it's an interesting one because the, that's the only Cameron film where I've not felt satisfied afterwards. Because I felt as though it um, technically it was hugely proficient. I got no issue with it on that level. It looks fabulous. It sounds fabulous. It's got, you know, and it's got um, you know. It, it, I understand the innovation and, and everything that went into it. The trouble is because it's dances with wolves uh, meets the Matrix on another planet. <laughs> um, you know, it, it kind of felt like. Yeah, it, it lacked the excitement of the Matrix and the emotional heft of Dances with Wolves. And it was so po-faced. I mean, it kind of, okay, I get that you're trying to make this simplistic student politics point about, you know, oh, um, you know, capitalism bad, environmentalism good, capitalism bad, environmentalism good. You know, literally until I got the urge to strip mine a third world country because I just was kind of like, stop it. Stop it, you know. You want to you want to sort of pick up a gun and massacre some Navi because they're so irritating. With all the money that you spent on that, couldn't you have written a better script? I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it, it didn't work for me, and I don't understand its popularity at all. Yeah, that's fair. What do you think of Avatar, Ian? Well, I thought it was I didn't hate it, but I thought it was a lot of fuss over nothing. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't Visually, yeah, aesthetically, I, I was impressed. But with any film, I want, I want, I'm all about the story. So I don't care how good it looks if it doesn't transport me, if it doesn't move me, if it doesn't cause me to feel something. And it just caused me to feel underwhelmed, really. Hey, it's yes, an I mean, emotion. You felt something. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted. I know. I, the thing is, I have to say this. I mean, I've watched it twice. So once in the sort of huge screen with 3D and all the rest of it. And then I, I watched it again on a small TV um, some months later and weirdly found it more engaging at that level because I think my expectations were so much lower. Um, you know, I thought, OK, well, I can watch this, you know, and just pretend it's a very extended episode of Star Trek or something, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I didn't, you know, and I, I didn't. But then it still irritated me. Mm. And it's interesting because I remember th- I'll tell you this much. I remember the year that came out. I remember in the first 10 minutes of the film thinking, wow, this is really visually impressive. And then I, and I remember the first 10 minutes thinking I must take my wife to see this. And then by the end of the film, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sitting through that again. Yeah. Mm. We might have already touched on this, but let, let, let's see. What would you consider to be your most controversial film opinion? And it can't be that uh, Avatar's no good because uh, we're with you on that one. No, OK, OK. Well, I've got two d- written down, scribbled down here, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether, which, way to, which way to leap on this. Um, I think yeah, I'm going to go... Pick for- the one that's going to get us angry. I don't know. I honestly don't know which is going to make you angry. Um, I'm going to go with this. I thought The Last Jedi was really good. Um, I'm with you on that one. Okay. I I thought The Last (laughs) Jedi was really good. And uh, I'll tell you why I thought this. Um, Slightly complicated, but 
I have to, again, I have to sort of bring this down to a personal level. I mean, we're just going to take as read that, yes, we know the visual effects are great. I mean, I thought it looked fabulous. You've got that incredible planet near the end with the, with the, you know, the, 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 the sand with yeah. the red and that, you know, just look beautiful visually. I think the performance is terrific. I think, uh, you know, Daisy Ridley and um, Adam Driver did terrific jobs in there. And the characters and the dynamics and the chemistry between them was really interesting. Uh, and I think that Mark Hamill was terrific. I think that, you know, it had some good, I mean, some great action scenes, the opening space battle, plus the the, the big fight with all the, um, the, the Snoke's guards. You know, which, which, by the way, completely took me by surprise the first time, because you know the way that scene starts, mm -hmm. you know, it comes with a big shock. And mm -hmm. when I saw it the second time, I, it was, I, I remember, I said, oh, I can actually enjoy this action scene now, because the first time I watched it, I was still reeling from the surprise of what had just preceded that. <laughs> um, but here's the, here's the thing that, that really, you know, I couldn't understand. I came out of that film completely blown away and couldn't understand why there was such a fan backlash against it now i'm a first generation star wars fan remember when the originals were out you know and i have been for years i was largely unimpressed with the prequels um but the last jedi was very different and for me it was a necessarily iconoclastic film it really did something different with the franchise which you know for me worked and i'll tell you why um because i've thought quite a lot about what i think is at the core of why this upset so many fans. And I think this is the reason. Um, when I was growing up, Star Wars meant a lot to me. And I, because of some of my own personal circumstances growing up, it, it um, you know, I, re I remember watching Star Wars and I would literally disappear into that world. And I would feel, you know, such an identity with Luke Skywalker. I mean, the, the funny thing is that, you know, you always wanted to be Han Solo, but really you were Luke, okay? <laughs> you know, you always wanted to be Han Solo, but really you were Luke. So I identified with Luke and then Luke, you know, in, in the course of the original films, he, ha you know, he has a big triumph, leaves home, but then leaving home is hard. And you really get that in The Empire Strikes Back. It's tough. <coughs> and, and then you get, you get this sense of, you know, you had, to, you had to face the dark side. And I had to face my dark side. And I had to, you know, I, I felt as though in my life I'd blown up a few emperors and uh, Death Stars and things. And, you know, there, was, there were some things that, that I had to confront as a child, and especially in school, that really, you know, I, I kind of, in a way, I felt like Luke's journey on a metaphorical level parallel paralleled some of mine and i you know and after return of the jedi i always thought well and of course luke went on and lived happily ever after made you know reformed the jedi you know and and you know became an incredible savior of the galaxy whatever and anyway so in the time passed and you know i grew older and i compromised and i became you know more cynical more world weary and life dealt a lot of blows to me and, um, you know, on a, on a quite personal level, lots of difficult things happened. And, you know, I created a few Kylo Rens of my own, I would say. And, uh, and I got to a point where, you know, I realized I didn't grow up to be the Luke Skywalker that, you know, I imagined grew up after Return of the Jedi. And then I went to see The Last Jedi and I thought, oh, my goodness me, Luke Skywalker didn't grow up to be the Luke Skywalker <laughs> I expected after Return of the Jedi. He became... You know, a cynical, bitter, you know, he sort of, you know, you know, naffed off to die on some remote planet because he'd failed, which, by the way, is completely in keeping with what happens in the original films with Yoda, with mm -hmm. Obi-Wan. You know, yeah. they just naffed off into the middle of nowhere to to get on with it. And, um, you know, it, it was like, you know, the film was holding up a mirror to me and. It, I really related to that on a, on a personal level and, and I found it quite profound and quite moving. And I think the trouble is that not everyone likes to have a mirror held up to them like that. Mm. Uh, and I think that psychologically it did something very interesting because obviously this is all dependent on personality, temperament, you know, background, upbringing, all sorts of things. And so when you hold a mirror up to someone like that, you're not necessarily going to get the kind of reaction that I had, which was to be, find it quite cathartic and moving yeah. sometimes it's gonna you know no i wanted luke skywalker to be um you know this incredible jedi who did all this stuff it's kind of like, but, but why did you want that because for me it was so much more plausible and believable that he was how he was depicted in the last jedi I'm, and, I'm, I'm with and you I, I, thought, I thought it was an incredible piece of work an incredibly mm. wise piece of work
it was a much, much better film. I think it will be the On Her Majesty's Secret Service of Star Wars films <laughs> in years to come. You know, it will yeah. be looked back on that way. And the thing is, the critics already loved it. It wasn't the critics that didn't like it. It was, as I say, a, a substantial part of the fandom. I, 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 I don't think it's a controversial opinion, though. I really liked it. And I prefer it a lot more to the um, the film that followed it. <laughs> um, Ian, did you have any thoughts on this? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you both. I liked it. I didn't like what followed. I think it seemed like the run out of ideas, but as a standalone film, I really, really did enjoy it. Um, yeah, some of it, some of the criticism about the plot being recycled, I get, but it was stuff that I loved about Star Wars, so I didn't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What did you, was, can I ask you a question? What did you think about the uh, depiction of Luke specifically? Because for me, that, that for me is the core issue, I think. Yeah, I think it was, as you said, all the things you said, I think it was good because it is good to be, there's an element of wanting it to be idealistic, that he beat the bad guys, that he was this, you know, huge, significant figure. But it what preceded that didn't happen, as you say, with Yoda, with Obi-Wan. It was that there was always some battle and there was a cost and a consequence to what they'd gone through, to what they'd done. And that they were in the minority fighting against, you know, a massive... Entity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, the thing that I would say is just to, just to that is that I can't help thinking that when you watch a film, often it's what you bring to the film that makes the, you're the final piece of the puzzle, aren't you? Yeah. So you know, when I felt that I brought something to the Last Jedi that made it work for me, but maybe it just doesn't for other people for, for the reasons that I outlined. And I think what you said there as a standalone film is significant because I think that for me, The Last Jedi almost is a standalone film because mm. if you look at The Force Awakens, um, you know, that's largely a retread of Star Wars yeah. for me. Um, you know, it works, but it's kind of, okay, whatever, I can live without it. It's not, you know, it, it didn't feel essential in the same way as The Last Jedi did. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, I I, I don't know. It's, it, to me, that's the core of it. And I think that... Um, the other thing I was going to, sorry, I was going to pick up on something else you, you said there. Um, it's gone out of my brain. I'm sorry. Carry on. It'll come. It may come back to me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, we're going to go to our last question uh, or last discussion, really. We will, we will be a little short on this one because I've realised we probably have gone on a bit longer than um, we intend to. But hey, that's okay. That's that's the good thing about discuss. It's, I feel like I've gone to get my printing again. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't been able to get out the office. Well, it's but that's all, not a bad it's thing. All, it's all good stuff. I, you know, I mean, I love, this is the reason why I do this. I love listening to people's opinions and thoughts on films and Simon's explanation of things that he likes and why he likes them. It's fascinating and obviously so much more comprehensive than the way I can articulate my feelings on films. So I love mm. listening to that. I love listening to what moves people, how they watch things. It's just, it's just fascinating. So. What I like as well is a lot of the stuff when you're talking about film, you're not just talking about the film, you're talking about the place in your life when you saw the film, because all of that affects how you see something, doesn't it? The, the yeah. fact that you, you grew up watching Star Wars, you became the cynical Luke Skywalker. Yes. It means you're watching the film in a different way. And that, part of watching film is, is what you bring to it just as much, I think. Which by the way, has reminded me what I was going to pick up on with what Ian was saying, which was that, you know, how people wanted Luke to be this heroic figure. And um, and I think that the irony of The Last Jedi is that, of course, ultimately he is. Mm. Everything that the, you know, he does something amazing, you know, force projects himself over to Kylo Ren. And I mean, that last standoff is incredible, but it's like something out of a Sergio Leone Western, <laughs> you know, where he's kind of <laughs> flicking off the, yeah. and, and the way he, and the way they do that, is fascinating because he has become Obi-Wan Kenobi at that point. You know, he all but says, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you could be. And <laughs> he doesn't actually say that, but he has his own variation on that line. And it's profoundly moving, I think, because it's like, well, the circle is now complete. He is yeah. now, you know, the, the, and it really, really, I, I move, okay, you talk about being moved to tears. It did move me to tears the way that Mm. Luke died as well, because for me, that's how it always should have been. You know, he was alone, but he was at peace and he had made the last stand. And it really, for me, completed the character arc of Luke perfectly. And ironically does do the thing 
that I think the fans wanted, which is to demonstrate this incredible power that he had. Right. Last discussion of, of, of today. Very exciting. Cinemas open again next week. I'm not going to ask you what you're going to go see because I, I know it's Peter Rabbit. I know that. <laughs> it's on the list. <laughs> um, but why, for you guys, um, is cinema so much better than just watching a film on the telly? Or just just for those people who... I don't know whether those people will be watching right now, but those people who are, it's okay, I'll watch it on my phone. Let's go to Ian first. Why is, why is cinema better? <laughs> and what is it about cinema that just is great? Well, but also the things that frustrate you. So the thing, I, I love the cinema. Um, I love... Even on a basic level, I love how dark it is. The 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 the, the light is either intentional or it's 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 extinguished. So I love that sensory ex- experience of that. The big screen, the sound. It's 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 just you know done in a way that you can't quite get at home. Whether it's the acoustics or just the the clarity of the sound. There's the aspect that I like is that it's communal, it's a shared experience, but it's individualistic mm. as well. I do like that, that you are in community. Um, but I think I choose my times when to go based on I love the cinema. I don't always love other people in the cinema. So, <laughs> for instance, so I, I, I will often not go to open a night just because it's going to be full of people that go and that don't, they're not as, I guess, neurotic as I am about watching it. They'll, they'll chat and they'll eat the food and they'll whisper and they'll get up and they'll walk. They'll turn the phone on and all these things irritate me. So I'd rather wait until a time when it's least likely anyone's gone either during the day, which my job allows me to do, or late at night or on a Friday night when everybody's, other people are out at the pub or whatever. So, so yeah, I love the cinema, but I love it more when I can fully focus on what's happening. Mm. I hate being distracted. I hate it just frustrates me so much. It becomes it goes from the best experience of watching a film to the worst quite easily. Yeah. For me. I get that. I get that. What about you, Simon? Okay, well, I want to pick up on some things Ian said. And Ian, I actually I've got I think we're just going to take it as a given that we all think that the big screen is better oh, as a yeah. as a general as a plum. And I completely agree with what you said there about the sensory thing, the immersion thing. You know, the fact that it goes dark. One of the things I love, by the way, about which always I think it's a, it's a bit of a lost art. Very few directors do this now, but going to black at a key point and actually plunging the cinema into darkness. I think the last time I think I saw this done really effectively was in The Fellowship of the Ring just before they, uh, as they go into the mines of Moria, um, I don't know if you remember, there's a rock fall and they get trapped inside. Uh, and at that point, the screen goes dark and it's totally dark. And I remember thinking that that's a really, and of course you can't get that effect at home um, of just being plunged into darkness like that. It's a very subtle art, the way that a great director will do that. Um, and so, yes, so, but then obviously you, you, the sound, the size of the screen, all of that sort of thing, immersion, the occasion, the sense of, uh, you know, the community aspect, which is interesting because whether it's you're laughing together or, yeah. or um, you know, jumping, jumping together. in a horror film together. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. actually, actually funny, funny you should mention the, the laughing thing. Uh, and just to pick up on the audience behavior thing. See, I want to, I want to say one thing. There is a myth and it is a myth that children are the worst behaved audiences. Because if you go and see, I guarantee, go and see Paddington in a packed cinema of children and listen to them laughing at that. That it is, honestly, it, the film is, it just elevates it 20 times. Mm. The, 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 the Being in the middle of all of that joy. It's, it's, you know, it's a little taste of heaven for me. It just, it, I absolutely love it. Um, you know, so it's, it's fine when you've got the interaction in that sense. It only becomes a problem when, you know, either the, you know, it's, you know, whether it's gangs of teenagers or, um, you know, just, just people who are badly, you know, no sense of self-awareness and etiquette. and People who don't uh, care that they're messing up your experience. Well, yeah, they're treating it like it's their living room. I mean, it, yeah. no, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, but I want to, I want to just say this. 
there is a, I have noticed because obviously I go to the cinema an awful lot and I've, I've noticed these trends. There is a sense in which I think this is slowly being brainwashed out of people. It is gradually with the emergence of technology, phones, all the rest of it. People are gradually realizing, no, this just isn't on. You don't mess. You know, you don't have annoying light pollution pings everywhere. Sometimes every time someone gets a message, that sort of thing. Um, I am seeing less and less badly behaved audiences. However, there are still, you know, a few bad apples. Um, to that end, Ian, I wanted to give some suggestions for you. I know you can go to matinee screening, so that's a great plus right there. Those those work perfectly. Me I have many cinema rage stories. Don't you <laughs> love? Time. Don't you love the screen hero? The person who gets up and tells somebody to be quiet. The thing you've been wanting to do and you've been thinking about. I think, am I going to do it? And somebody else gets up and does it. And inside you Let go on, son. I, I, I am going to just tell you that that is me. I do that. <laughs> I, I have absolutely zero tolerance for it because I just think, you know, because instead of having to go out and fetch an usher when then you miss part of the film, whatever, it's, you know, and you need to stamp on that immediately. I'll, I'll not because, name the person. Look, I'll tell you, I'll, but, um, I'll not name the person because they could get into trouble. But I remember going to the cinema with somebody once and there was some kids in front of us and they were really, you know, they were being really obnoxious and messing around. And he leaned forward and he grabbed them both by the necks from behind and whispered in the ears and said, I am not a very nice person. <laughs> Shut up. And I went back and nothing for the rest of the cinema. Nothing for the rest of the cinema. <laughs> Luke, was, yeah. that, was that you? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Well, I wonder what it's going to be like now when we go back. Because um, I think certainly initially, the people who are going to go are the people who really missed going. Yeah. Um, it might be a different experience going back. You know, those, those people who, who were just there to hang out somewhere have probably found someone well, else to I, hang out. I think it's fair, it's fair <laughs> to say as well that this is this happens a minority of times it doesn't happen a lot usually my experience is very good um particularly now that i'm going to the everyman which i think is aimed at a more upmarket um customer really because it's more expensive it's more like a night out with foods and drinks and cocktails and stuff so there's not many young people that will pay the 12 or 13 pounds it is well, yeah. to go to an everyman so but i also have the thing where I, I have a different... Well, some people seem to think that they'll go quiet once the film starts, but I want to watch the trailers. I mean, we had a discussion about trailers last week where <laughs> they're starting to show too much now, but I genuinely enjoy the trailers to know what I'm going to watch in the future. But pe some of the people just dismiss them as a an optional extra. Well, they're mm. not. So if you're watching this and you chat through the trailers, stop it. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with that. I'm, okay, I'm going to just completely agree with you there, Ian. And here's why. Because you make anxious people like me think you're going to natter through the film, so I can't relax. So, you know, I don't have quite the same attachment to the trailers, yes, but at the same time, just shut up. Because, you know, you're making me nervous. You're making me, you're putting me on edge and you're making me think I'm going to have to tell you to shut up when the film comes on. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. It's, a, you know, natter elsewhere. It's it's you know I'm just gonna I've got one more cinema rage story to tell you because because you know, sorry this I want to say this in defence of young people okay because I was a teenager once and I no. used to go to the cinema religiously and I would you know I'd hated badly behaved audiences as much then as I do today so it isn't always young people I've been I mean I remember going you know in groups of my friends who were like minded and yeah we would behave impeccably. So it's not always young people, no, but no. sometimes it's grown-ups who really ought to know better. And again, it always seems to be in 18 rated films. I, I remember going to see the film Eden Lake. I don't know if you've seen that. It's kind of... That think, film uh, traumatised the life out of me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... I don't know if it's politically I, correct I could to not say walk patch, past a bunch of hoodies after seeing that film for a long time. Yeah. Well, it's... it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's deliverance... Um, with you know, with hoodies. With hoodies. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the. I don't know what the kind of. I'm sort of trying to avoid offensive terms, but um, you know, it's 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 a very interesting horror film. But but and it is it is scary. But here's the thing. I went to see it, and again, relatively quiet cinema, and it was late at night again, and I uh, sat there, and a group of about half a dozen women who were obviously on a hen night 
came in and sat a few rows behind me. And there was, as I say, it was about half a dozen of them. Actually, I don't think they were on a... No, sorry. They weren't on a hen night because they were older. They, they, I mean, they looked... Well, they old, people can, old people can get married too. Okay, so <laughs> they, were, they were in... I would say they were sort of our age, 30s, 40s, I don't know. Um, and they were nattering incessantly throughout the film. And I was sitting there, I was thinking, why are you here? And I just, I kept shushing her. Why are you here? Go to the pub. Go to the pub. Why are you? And, you know, and halfway through the film, they left. They did presumably go to the pub. And I was like, again, it's like, why did you bother? If you wanted to natter, why didn't you just go to the pub? It just beggars, but anyway, um, sorry, for some reason, it, 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 it reminded me of that. <laughs> I didn't realise this, uh, this question was going to invoke such rage. <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 uh, I have, listen, I've actually only scratched the surface okay. of, of some of my cinema rage stories. There's one or two that I just don't want to make public. Well, that's, that's a fascinating conversation. I mean, we've gone way beyond our normal time, but it's just been all fascinating stuff and really, really good to have you with us, Simon, and uh, tap into your love and knowledge of films, really. Well, thank you. It's been really fun to, to meet you and to see you again, Luke. And uh, I have achieved my personal goal of doing that printer thing again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you've, it's really took me back. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for joining us. And thank you, everyone who's been watching or listening along as well. And uh, we'll be back next week. Yep. Let us know your thoughts. Get in touch if you were interested and coming on and joining us and telling us about the films that you love and your experiences, um, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Thanks very much. See Thanks. you. See you. Bye.